It is such a pleasure for me to be um, worshiping you, with you this morning. This is not my first time in the Young uh, Church. Um, I actually have served as the interim here twice before. Um, once going way, way back to Joe Shank's days when Ken Bailey was on sabbatical. I was here for about three months. That was quite an experience. Joe Shank turned 40 at that time, I remember, and it really seems like a long time ago to me because um, our daughter turned 40 <laughs> this past week. It's like, ah, how does that make me feel? Um, and then I, um, I served as the interim associate when Lorraine Giles was here before your settled associate, Peter Pawnee, was here. So um, this, is, uh, this was a real treat to be called to um, ask if I would come today. Um, to lead worship and also to talk to you about the story of Moses in the Bible. After all, he was the greatest leader that Israel would ever know. Perhaps we were introduced to him in Sunday school when we imagined the formidable man who brought the stone tablets inscribed with the laws of Yahweh God down from Mount Sinai. Imagine him as an endangered Hebrew infant drifting gently in a wicker basket on the Nile River. His plaintive cries among the bulrushes led to his rescue and adoption by the daughter of the Egyptian king himself, as Julie told you. And if our teachers taught us well, we came to realize that all the stories about Moses are much more than ancient tales meant only for Jews. Because of our Christian roots in Judaism, Moses plays a significant part of our story as well. And today, we pick up the tale again. Many years have passed, maybe more than you realize. Moses is a grown man now, middle-aged. He has been wondering for some time about his real origins. It began as a niggling feeling that he was not who everyone, especially his dear mother, said he was. Perhaps he had on occasion he even left the ivory tower of Pharaoh's court to see what life in this country he had come to call home was really like. He had seen the glorious cities and massive pyramids his adoptive grandfather, the Pharaoh, had built or inherited. However, Moses had also witnessed the hard labor that the Egyptian king demanded in order to achieve those architectural feats. Oddly enough, and inexplicably, Moses had developed an abiding, and given his circumstances as Pharaoh's grandson, a peculiar connection to the Hebrew slaves who had made those imagined wonders a reality, brick by mud and straw brick. One day, we're told in an earlier chapter of the book of Exodus, Moses witnessed a particularly harsh Egyptian taskmaster hard at his job of making the Hebrew slaves as miserable as possible. At the sight of a foreman raising an animal whip above a wretched slave's head, the bile rose in Moses', Moses throat. A deep anger and resentment boiled over in his heart, and when he thought that no one was watching, Moses slit the foreman's throat and hastily buried the corpse in a shallow, sandy grave. Perhaps Moses should have realized that no misdeed remains secret forever, because someone did see, and word spread among the enslaved people. And they were terrified of Moses and his odd association to them. And word got to the Pharaoh, too. And now there was a price on his head to boot. Rejected by the Hebrews, outlawed by the Egyptians, now a man without a country, Moses fled far into the wilderness. Many tiring and thirsty days later, he ended up in Midian, in the northwestern reaches of the Arabian Desert. And there he sat by a local well one morning, even as his, as his ancestor Jacob once had, long before. And Moses watched as the daughters of Jethro, the local priest, tried to wedge their way past a bunch of boisterous shepherds to get water for their goats and sheep. Moses, being a good man at heart, came to their aid and later went home with them for dinner. As luck would have it, Moses' reputation had not preceded him. So he settled comfortably in Midian, married Zephyrah, one of the daughters, raised a family, and worked for his father-in-law tending the sheep and goats. Tradition has it 
that he was in the, this voluntary exile for some 40 years. From the privileges of Pharaoh's court to the degrading job of being someone else's shepherd, Moses' career path was hardly one to be particularly proud of. But time marched on and he began to draw his social security and became eligible for Medicare and thereby slid in a rather undistinguished way into retirement. However, never let it be said that age alone exempts anyone from feeling that holy nudge and persistent sacred tapping on the shoulder. You see, Moses must have been pushing 80 when that awkward lamb danced away from the flock one day, out of sight around the bend and up, up the cobbled trail toward the heights of Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai, as we sometimes call it. Our elderly shepherd chased after the lamb as best he could, but with his old arthritic knees, no wonder he tripped twisted his ankle and ripped the hem of his robe, but got up, scrambled onward, and nearly fell into the brambly bush that had caught fire in front of him. And here we find him this morning. Moses' first thought was to make a fire break so the flames would not scorch the mountain itself. Instead, he stopped dead in his tracks because he saw that this fire was quite unusual. The bush burned, but was not consumed by the flames. Moses hesitated, who wouldn't have, but curiosity got the best of him, and he ventured closer for a better look. That was when he heard the voice, perhaps reminiscent of James Earl Jones, or Morgan Freeman, or Charlton Heston, or maybe even Dolly Parton, or Kate Winslet. Whoever it sounded like hardly matters. It was a godlike voice, no doubt about it. What mattered were the words it spoke, which were, Moses, Moses. Taken aback, Moses stood there doltishly and said what came first in his mind. Hey, here I am, over here. And the voice, perhaps unsure that Moses had fully grasped the situation and knew with whom he was conversing, commanded him, Moses, take off your shoes for you are standing on holy ground. Yikes, thought Moses, as he presumably kicked his sandals off and then, according to the text, covered his face and waited for the Holy One to continue. And sure enough, God, because that was who the voice belonged to, made a pronouncement. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Surely Moses, faced out in the dirt by this time, whispered into his sleeve, Awesome, great idea. Those slaves will appreciate that. You have been distant for quite some time now. I am behind you all the way. You go, sacred voice in the bush. But that was not all, the voice said. It continued. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Whoa, hold on there, buddy bush. Now that is a horse or a camel of a different color. These are my golden years. I'm past my prime. Having great difficulty in getting his words right, Moses eventually spat out a couple of questions to the bush that continued to serenely burn. Question number one. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? The fact that I have a price on my head in my adoptive country notwithstanding, I have got a wife at home and kids and a steady job, even though I am technically retired, not a great job, but a steady one, and in this economy, <laughs> that's not something to sneeze at. Get real. <clears throat> I am a nobody. Or as Disciples of Christ Pastor Corey Wilkinson imagines, me? God, you couldn't be suggesting that I go, could you? I mean, I'm a worker, not a leader. I'm one of the behind-the-scenes people. God's answer was simply this. I will be with you and the ground we walk upon together will be holy ground. What more do you need? Question two. 
Okay, that is all well and good. But if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his or her name? What shall I say to them? Who are you anyway? God's answer was again simple, but it described the essence of the Holy One. It was an answer that is still so fraught with mystery that it has swirled down through the ages so that even today, even here, we are still trying to figure out exactly what it means. Tell them that I am Yahweh. I am who I am, or I will be what I will be. I am what I will be. Or, as Christian writer and poet Tom Schumann writes, Wells is the mystery. Most days I am who I am, but on alternate Tuesdays I like I will be that which I am now. In months that have only 30 days, you might call me I am who causes to exist. But always, always, I am who gives life. Tell them I am who I am. Surely that will convince them. Not bloody likely, Moses probably snorted into his sleeve as he spit the sand out of his mouth. And our rather reluctant Israelite goes on in the next verses in this story to ask for a few visual aids and an assistant if he is even going to think about taking on the job. Finally, however, Moses agrees to God's demand. He answers God's call affirmatively, though undoubtedly tentatively and surely without a whole lot of confidence. And then the bush was gone. Ashes trembled in the wind, settled to, to mark a walkway down the mountain. The land danced downward upon the winding cinder path. Moses, both exhausted and exhilarated, first limped after the lamb, and then began to imitate its skipping. God only knows where this dance is going to lead us, he muttered. He turned to look back at the summit of the mountain. It's up to you, he shouted. I have no idea where we're heading, and turned to follow, stumbling down the pathway. And there it is. Moses has gone from being keeper of sheep to the deliverer of a nation. Well, I suppose for us, as written in a blog entitled Magdalene's Musing, the good news is that God is, isn't calling most of us to rescue whole nations, but the sobering news is God is calling us. Well, what in heaven's name does that mean for you sitting here or who might be listening to this later on in the week? We're not even really past COVID and more and more often it seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket and we are certainly not Moses staring into some flaming shrub. Perhaps all that is true, but this story illustrates a different perspective. Moses' experience points out that you are never too old to do the work of the kingdom, the work of God's dream. You are never too young, either. God will never deem you too busy or too important or too unimportant. God gives out no free passes or buys. Each one of us is called. Why Moses practically came out of a geriatric home when he reluctantly could not de deny the sacred nudge any longer. And so you, whoever you are and wherever you are on your life's journey, and because you are right here this morning and not somewhere else, you are called to do what you can to ensure that the Spirit is alive and well here at First Parish in Yarmouth. Through all the ways that you already were the sacred and the secular, through studying about race together, creating a ministry in a Sunday school classroom, being trained as a liturgist or a deacon, tackling social justice issues, just hanging in there through the ups and downs of COVID. Each one of you is called by God because you are an integral part of this community. And I would submit that whatever else you may be individually called to here, you are called collectively to re-envision just what First Parish Yarmouth is to create a path forward that will reshape your future as a United Church of Christ congregation here in Maine. Each one of you is called to imagine what you want this church to be 5, 10, 20, 50 years down the road. And don't get me wrong, every church everywhere is called to recognize 
first and foremost, that who you will be is not who you are now. The church will not look like it does now. That much is certain. And I think we've begun to see that over these last few years of COVID. What you will look like, who you will be in this town, is something guided by the Spirit you are called to define and perhaps even reshape. As it said on your church website, your goal is to dream about how best to match your gifts to the world's need and how blessed you are to already be a seed in good soil with deep and tested roots. As your website also said, you have much to offer the community and the world around you. How exciting. And I would suggest that no one is too old or young or busy or important or unimportant to be first part of the conversation and then part of the action plan. In the Exodus story, God called out Moses, Moses. But God might just as well have said, Julie, Leslie, Amanda, you get the picture. You are all in this call business together. You see, if you're tempted to respond like Moses did, whoa, hold on, I'm not equipped to do this. I'm not the visioning sort. If this involves too much change, count me out. I still like the old hymns, the way life used to be around here. I think it should be someone else's job to step up and take on something new. Been there, done that, someone else's turn now. If you're tempted to respond like that, and all of us do to a greater or lesser extent, then you would do well to remember God's response to Moses, hemming and hawing. I will be with you. God replied, you will not be alone as you hammer out a vision and put it into action. After all, you are on holy ground. And finally, remember that main business, I am who I am. Perhaps within those sometimes meaningless words lies what you need to trust as you move forward into the fall, into a new church season, into the future together as a church community. As Lutheran pastor Edward Mar Marcourt has eloquently written, what is the message of Yahweh's name? God's name is a verb, God is action, movement. God is a be verb. I will be father, I will be mother, I will be son, I will be daughter. I will be anything you want to be. I will be anything you need. If you are thirsty, I am water. If you are starving, I am food. If you are all alone, I am friend. If you are weak, I am strong. No matter what you need, I am all things for you. I am with you, I am in you, I am for you. I am everything you need. You cannot lock God into I am father. You cannot lock God into I am mother. You cannot lock God into anything because God is essentially mysterious, the ground of all that is, the ground on which you stand, the holy ground. No burning bush for us, perhaps, but holy nonetheless. At my installation service at the Reagan Village Church from which I retired, UCC pastor Paul Shoup stood at the pulpit and said to me, sitting, feeling very small in the second row, take off your shoes, Nancy, for you are standing on holy ground. You too are standing on that same holy ground. Yes, you. And so I offer you the same invitation. Take off your shoes if you wish. Seriously, take them off if you feel comfortable doing that and look at your beautiful feet firmly grounded. Doing so is a symbol, really, for the voice of God whispering, I am with you, what more do you need? Like Moses, you may not know where the path is leading, but also like Moses, you can trust that if you listen to the Holy One and walk with the great I am, you will make your way towards a new reshaping, a new future for yourself and this faith community that each of you loves in your own way and where you have chosen to serve.